which was lit all, all the way down. You would start to walk into this thing, and then suddenly you'd be pulled down it. And you would more or less be projected. You didn't walk through it as such. You were more or less propelled through it. You walked into it. You walked into it, correct? Right. Start. Then you were propelled down the thing like some force grabbed you and pulled you through. And you would go down this, and you would go be propelled down this tube, as it were, this tunnel, which was not straight. It was, it was corkscrew. And it would not go in a straight line either. It would take some very strange turns, which we could not explain. But it did take turns, and you'd come out at the other end, wherever you were supposed to come out, and uh, meet somebody or do something at the other point. And did you have like a vision? Yes. Decided to go into the final series of tests and preparation. So about July 20th of 43, they decided, well, I guess it's ready. So they decided 22 July, got the whole crew together, selected about 12 individuals plus the two of us who were in the control room to operate all the equipment. The orders came by a radio, fire up, and go through the procedures, in which we did. The ship became invisible optically as well as radar. And it came back. When it came back, uh, they knew immediately something was wrong. There were four men embedded in the decks, two in the steel decks on top, two on the bulkhead walls, and the fifth man had his hand jammed in the steel of the wall. He lived because they could cut his hand off and give him an artificial hand. People disoriented. Reports were some were floating around and finally got their feet on the ground. Others floated away and disappeared. The crew on the second test was a little larger than the first. And uh, a number who were just plain totally insane. The subject today is a little bit different than what I have normally done. Uh, last year, I gave you a fairly detailed history of the Philadelphia experiment and how it tied into the Phoenix project. Today, my intent is somewhat different. I wish to show the background connections between the two projects, how they happened, the politics that was involved, and the interlocking uh, controls, if you will, and the communication which resulted in the two tests locking to each other, how this really occurred, and why, and what other problems were developed because of this. It's a rather involved story, but I only have 45 minutes, so I will again try to keep this rather brief. As you know, the Philadelphia experiment culminated in two tests for the Eldridge, or if you don't know it, I'll state it now. The original 22 July 1943 test for the Eldridge, which was bad enough in terms of the personnel problem, but did not lock up to the Phoenix project. And the final test, 12 August 1943, in which the ship went into hyperspace and it was a total disaster when it came back and the nature of that disaster actually was far greater than anyone realizes and the potential was unbelievably bad i wish to go into that and what happened and how it was averted the phoenix project actually has been covered very well by preston nichols and he will be going into some of that today and some resurrection of the technology and how it worked so I will not go into that at all. I really don't understand what happened in terms of the politics and what led up to it. We have to go back to the beginning. The project started, as I have previously stated, University of Chicago, 1931, with Dr. John Hutchinson, Nikola Tesla, and a staff physicist, Dr. Emil Kurtenauer. The important point here in the history we have to follow is what happened in terms of Tesla. By 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president of the United States. 33 is elected, and he became actual president in March of 34. In those days, it was March 20th. They've changed the date to 20 January since. And when he was in office, he invited his old friend Nikola Tesla down to Washington, as they have known each other since 1917, exchanging amenities, and uh, President Roosevelt asking Tesla, well, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? 
And of course, the president already knew about the ongoing work on Project Invisibility, but there were other things Tesla had been into which were exchanged. And among other things, Tesla mentioned the fact that he had been in communication with extraterrestrials. Now this very much intrigued the president, who unknown to the general public, was very much interested in metaphysics and rather abstruse matters. He was very curious about this, and uh, Tesla told him a little bit about it. The equipment had been developed for such communication by RCA, which Tesla had been a member and um, staff member since 1919. And in 1935, he became vice president and director of engineering and research worldwide, a post he held in 19 until 1939 when he retired from RCA. In that period of time, he developed some super sensitive receivers, basically designed for RCA's use in overseas communication and also a few transmitters here and there, all of which came in usefully to Tesla in his ongoing quest for knowledge. So he told FTR he had been in communication with several groups. Roosevelt was curious, can I talk with them? And uh, Tesla said, definitely, now I can arrange it if you wish, and he did. After which Roosevelt decided he would like to meet some of these people. Mm -hmm. And I asked Tesla, is this possible? And he says, I believe it is. He said, there's two groups principally you might be interested in talking with. He says, if you have in mind making any kind of a deal, because at that time, as everyone knows, we were in the midst of a terrible depression, and Roosevelt was looking for some means to get out of it, to end it. In those days, he was perhaps a little bit more altruistic than might have been the case later. So arrangements were made to meet two groups. First, the Pleiadians, and then later, a K group, as I call them, the Kondrashkin. He met first with the Pleiadians. They gave a pitch as to what they might be able to do to help. He says, fine, but I want to talk with the other group first before I make a decision. So we talked with the second group and decided in favor of the second group. And the Pleiadians at that point bowed out. And as a matter of fact, went over to Nazi Germany and made a deal with Hitler which I'll not get into because that's another long story, but it does figure in the background precedent to World War II and the development of German technology. So Roosevelt accepted their offer of help in which they said they would provide some new industries and other things. 1938, an offer was made to set up the entire new industry called atomic energy, which of course we have today. The Ro President Roosevelt was very uh, interested and very receptive to the idea. And he consulted with his various advisors and the military, and the military says, whoa, if you let aliens set up an industry like this, even though it's on our home turf, and they are in essence controlling it and know where it can go, what happens? We do not have true control over it. What's going to happen in the future? Will we become vassals or slaves to them? The military advised against it, and Roosevelt turned his mind against it, and so advised them, and they became upset and says, well, there's nothing else we can do for you, and disappeared into the woodwork. Well, in those days, of course, we did have intelligence apparatus, but it was not anywhere as near as efficient as today, and they did not have all of, have all of the niceties of spying, which we have now. So by 1940, Roosevelt was becoming very concerned where have these characters gone? What are they doing? They were quite literally vanished, as far as we could determine, or I should say the president and the staff could determine. He says, what are we going to do about this? Well, somebody came up with a bright idea. Mr. President, why don't we go out and find some of those psychics that are running around here and see if we can find some really good ones, and maybe they can tell us where they are and what they're doing. The president said, fine. Harry Bennett who was then the president's right-hand advisor, was appointed the task of finding some good psychics and setting up a secret organization. He did. That organization, founded in 1940, later became known as the Psych Corps. Very important for many reasons. It has been, until recently, the backbone and mainstay of some very high-level spying operations and uh, intelligence on which many agencies have depended. Now that organization in its infancy in 1940 was set up by hired psychics who could prove they had their stuff named together and knew what they were doing and could prove it. And they were given new identities and put in a secret warehouse in Arlington, Virginia, at least initially, and went about their tasks. 
whether or not they ever found any missing key people, I don't know. But that organization expanded. It was set up to be a permanent organization, and of course Harry Bennett had to look for a man to head it up and organize it, train the people, and set up a total program. They found such a man late 1940. He was hired in 1941, and he set up the training programs. And uh, from that point on, they were looking basically for pairs, identical paired twins, which were ideal for the type of training they were doing, mostly male, some female pairs. And if they couldn't find them as time went on, they did use computers to computer match, but this came much later. Eventually, the CIA was formed. They took over the organization. And that was in 1947. About 1950, NSA came into being, and they inherited the Psych Corps, and it's been on the control of NSA ever since. So what did they really do, and what function did they serve? As time went on, and they expanded, and they did expand into about 50 operating pairs at their peak, perfect spies. They could penetrate virtually anything on this planet. And of course, after World War II was over, they were very interested in what they could do in terms of spying on Russia. Uh, perhaps unbeknownst to us at first, the Russians also set up their own group, and there were several groups set up in other countries. But I'm only concerned with what happened here. The man who was chosen to head this organization up and actually remained its director until he retired in 1984, there's a gentleman by the name of Emil P. de Costain. Perhaps some of you have heard the name. I know a few people have, but very few, because he was very much undercover. He was born in 1900. A very unusual thing I found out about him, which hardly anybody knew about until after he would retired. He was himself a walk-in. I guess who? The K Group. So if you want to do some spying on the organization that's spying on you, take over the directorship. And they did. Important for a reason because of what it led into in terms of the two experiments. The Philadelphia experiment, as I previously stated, locked up at the Phoenix Project. And it could only lock up on a very critical date. And that critical date was the 12th of August. 1943 and the 12th of August 1983. Theoretically, it could have locked up in 1963, but there was no ongoing experiment at that time, such as the Phoenix Project, which was required. Dr. John Van Neumann was, of course, the second and final director of the Philadelphia Experiment. He was also the first director of the Phoenix Project when it came online after the war, and it went through several phases. But the important phase of the Phoenix Project was from 1975 through 1983 when they developed the t capability of time travel and the time tunnels, as Dr. Carl Sagan liked to call them, the wormholes in space. Wormholes in space and time, they had the capability and it was fully functional. Someone had to know, in order to get these two experiments on either end to lock up, that there were critical dates in which it would work, and the rest of the years in between it would not work. And someone had to communicate this information to both ends. And this is the thrust of my discussion, and what happened, and why this whole thing locked up, and what some of the mechanics of, and technology of time is all about. I have a few slides I will add and put in here a little bit later, but I want to get into some more of this material first. The director of the Psy Corps himself was obviously a psychic. And he went on through the period of time, and because he was a member, in essence, of the K Group, and most of your aliens have the capability of time travel, they knew what was going on at both ends. I've stated in the other prior lecture, and I'll have to state it again, the real purpose of the two projects, quite aside from the uh, patent scientific advancement, which was desired by our scientists here in the United States and on Earth, was the purpose of locking these two projects up for a very specific reason. The very specific reason was to provide a rift in space-time 40 years wide over there long enough to let some very large spaceships through from another t time frame dimension. 
Now, in 1947 onward, the K group was pretty much lost. And came 1954, there was another group which came into uh, purview of the government, and that was, of course, the Greys. There was a series of UFO crashes in New Mexico in 1947, 48, and 49. I won't go into them in detail. But because of that, the government sent a call out through the vast array of radio telescopes in New Mexico, a call for help into outer space. We have an alien here. We don't know what to do with him. He's ill. Uh, how do you take care of him, et cetera, et cetera? Is there anybody out there that knows who he is and what you do with him? The government got an answer. It took a while, but they got an answer. A group of small ships showed up in about 1953 with some greys on them, and then there was an exchange of uh, ideas and thoughts, and some hostages went both ways. With the promise of return in 1954, which the greys did do in very large numbers, landed at either Edwards or Holloman Air Force Base, or both. Eisenhower disappeared out of Palm Springs in one of his golfing weekends to Edwards, met with the aliens, and signed an agreement a non-interference agreement in which we agreed not to interfere with each other's civilizations and there would be an exchange of technology. Well, the non-interference agreement uh, didn't last very long because it became very obvious to our government that the Greys weren't keeping it and what exchange of technology took place was not perhaps all that was expected. The important point was that our government agreed to provide basis for them underground, some 75, full underground railroad system. Construction started in 1959. But the Greys came in very large numbers. We don't know how many. The government perhaps does. It's an estimated now they're probably in excess of one million. And a very large ship that came in wanted to orbit around Earth, and they provided shuttles down to the surface of the Earth. They could not have gotten through without that rift in space-time. They were here. Other groups were here. There was a group from Orion. They actually were in charge of, in many respects, not formally, but in charge of the scientific development of the Phoenix Project. Therefore, they knew what it was capable of. They helped set up the science and the technology. And they also knew of the critical dates. The dates of 12 August is actually the function of the Earth's biorhythms. The Earth has a series of biorhythms, four of them, which, like the human biorhythms, do peak out once every so often. Nobody in our scientific community knew anything about this. It turns out, from what I've learned, that the ancients knew about it. The, uh, let us say, the recluse lamas in Tibet and elsewhere knew about it. They do have a great deal of knowledge. And they knew that the Mother Earth is actually a living entity, unlike the rock science, which is taught to us in the colleges and has a sort of consciousness, perhaps nothing we can understand. But nonetheless, as a living entity, has its own biorhythms. And those biorhythms, four of them, peak out once every 20 years. A window approximately a day wide, usually falls on the 12th of August, plus or minus a day, because our Gregorian calendar is not all that accurate. It misses 0.24 days per year, and once every century, you have to add a year to correct the calendar. Nonetheless, that was known to these aliens. Now, Emil Castain was in the middle of this, and he had to provide a connecting link, and as did also the aliens. Where we were in 1943 with that test, we had no knowledge of any kind why that date which was handed to us for the second test the 12th of August, which was given to us as a drop-dead test, which came from above the office, uh, the top office personnel, namely the Chief of Naval Research in the Navy Department. We knew the order came from beyond him, but at that time we had no idea where from. It came out of the little White House. There was two gentlemen in there who uh, more or less had uh, the knowledge and the communications. Harry Bennett provided the authority, and Dr. Costain provided the connection and the drop-dead date was handed down on the authority of the White House to the Chief of Naval Operations that it must be conducted by the, or on the 12th of August. But the problems we had, the Navy knew, and those people knew, 
that uh, Dr. von Neumann was going to delay as long as possible on the final test. We'd get as much time as possible. He worked around the clock trying to correct the problem because he knew he had a serious problem. And they could not correct it. In any case, it waited until the 12th of August, which was the desired slot. On the other end, we had the Phoenix Project. Now, what is the history, very, very briefly, of the Phoenix Project? Its hardware became functional about 1975 in the earliest phases. Preston Nichols has gone into this heavily in the past. And by 77, it was operational. By 79, all the changes had been made. And it was signed off as a functioning entity, a fully operational project in 1980, and it was functioning from that point until it crashed on the night of 12 August 1983, sabotaged. That, however, is not germane to this part of the story. On the 1st of August of 1983, something very unusual happened. Prior to that time, the operation of the station, the Montauk operation, Project Phoenix, had been on an intermittent basis, several hours a day, maybe eight hours a day, once every two or three days, whatever they had going in the way of a project where they wanted to utilize the equipment, they used it. But it was never used on a continuous basis, day after day. On the 1st of August, an order came down through the channels that the station would be turned on and left operational continuously until further notice. That meant around the clock, and it was. Now, what did this mean? I'm going to first show you a few slides, and then going to get into a little bit of, well, shall we say, whiteboard operation to show some of the aspects are involved in terms of the time. I've shown these slides before, but perhaps it's a good reminder. The Philadelphia experiment took place in outside of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Where is the pointer? Ah, there it is. Right opposite a little town, if we can get a little better focus, entitled called Red Bank, is where the Philadelphia Navy Yard is still, though it may not be after this year is over. They are threatening to close it. The average was docked here when they ran the test. They went down the river here a distance, quite a distance to where the bay was at least two miles wide. It was about a mile on this point. They went further down the line here. This is, of course, a picture of the famous Eldridge file shot. I will not go into the equipment other than to say the main body of equipment was in this little cubicle. That was the door where we went in and out. In the test, there was a special antenna mast on top here, designed by T. Townsend Brown, a special omnidirectional phased array to handle the output from four transmitters. And this was the ship for the final test that was used in the Philadelphia Harbor, further down, of course, away from Philadelphia. The Phoenix Project took place on the extreme end of Long Island, way out here on the tip, and there was a park there. There was a town of Montauk a little further in. There was a state park out there and also a military base. It does not show in this photo, or actually map it by AAA because this is the most recent one. The earlier ones show the military base inactive. Fort Hero, in the extreme end, had been there since 1916, perhaps, prior to World War I, and was abandoned in 1986 after all the tests were over. But that was where the other end of the terminal, shall we say, of the two experiments took place, out here. And that was the Phoenix Project, the prime home. At one time, there were 25 operating ones. And that was the one that caused the lockup, the one that was primarily concerned. In case you haven't seen any of the photos, I'll only show two. The main radar tower from the SAGE system, which was adapted and changed to the Phoenix Project. There's this, and that's what you see driving east from Montauk. It's a huge building and a tower with the antenna on top, which is 60 feet high and 120 feet across and weighs approximately 125 tons. And close up, if you get on the base, which is open, and you can wander out there if you want to, 
that go during the day. This is the tower, eight feet, approximately eight stories high, and with the antenna, the total height is about 150 feet, when we estimate. Now I'm going to leave this slide on because what we were dealing with, very briefly again, in the structure of our universe as we know it, is a five-dimensional universe, five-dimensional nature, other than it is in the blackboard. And time is it of itself, as I think this slide is familiar to Bob Yedlick, is in the form of a huge torus and is a structure. This is a mathematical representation, of course. You have a central flow of time through the center, a more or less linear flow, which we call the time we measure, a fourth dimension. And of course, you have this helical coil on the outside which actually establishes the time rate flow. And this is called T2 and is actually the fifth dimension. Now what I need to get into here a little bit is what really goes on. is somewhat uh, poorly done, but I'm not a great artist. We'll call this one, two, three, uh, three dimensions of physical reality as we know them. And according to theory, Einstein et al., time at the right angle, we'll call a fourth dimension, is at a right angle theoretically. These three physical dimensions flow and exist in time. If there was no time, our reality, our physical reality would not exist. So it's supposedly these are at right angles. It flow according to a rate which you can describe in the torus of time. But there's another important aspect, and this is the very important one. We actually have a fifth dimension, we'll call it T2, which is the fifth. And it is, if you look at it on end from the torus, take a cross section, this is a neat little thing which is really another vector on the end of the fourth dimension, which is the fifth. And this thing is describing, in essence, a circle. And as it corkscrews ahead, we call it forward time by mere reference. We don't know whether we're going forward or we're going backwards. It depends upon which universe you're looking at. But it creates the fourth dimensional vector in the center, which is a more or less even flow, theoretically very even. We'll not go into other problems which could change that rate in terms of the universe. This was what we were playing with in the project, and actually this is what they were playing with in both projects. It is time in its essence. Now the Eldridge had a field created around it, the purpose of which was, again using the pointer, and looking at this, purpose of which, when the confined field of the average was to change the helical rate. If you change the helical rate, you change the time flow, but you don't want to speed it up to the point where the ship disappears. What you want to do is something rather exotic. I'm saying what you want to do because what they wanted to do and what they did do are two different things. Speaking in terms of the looking on the end of this, let's say this torus, our reality here, we we'll call it reality one. You have a free a second reality at 90 degrees, a third and a fourth, and you can even have a fifth. The second order reality is at 90 degrees. But you don't want to take the average that far in terms of the time element. You're rotating it around the torus, and what you do you start pulling it around by speeding up the corkscrew, then you lock it at that point by going back to the normal rate so that at 60 degrees approximately, the average is optically invisible and radar invisible. If you stop a little before that, which is what they did in the final test, let's say perhaps 45 degrees, it's radar invisible but not optically invisible, almost, but not quite. So you rotate it and you hold it in terms of what is within the field. What's outside, theoretically, you don't worry about. Well, that was the theory, and of course the 
aspect of this is very interesting, namely the Eldridge and the generators were creating a sixth order field so that they could manipulate the fifth order field which was T2 or the second order time. And we have five orders of uh, five dimensions if you will, five orders however you want to express it in our reality and again going back to what Bob said the other night which is very neat you have a sixth dimensional order which is an isolation between the next five which is the reverse universe actually the contra in the matter and if you go beyond the 11th as van neumann knew you then are in hyperspace and the 12th order to get this project to work in terms of shoving the eldridge into hyperspace and creating the bubble and creating the entire rift in time required a 12th order function now the average was capable of a sixth order function which would not do it and i remember some of the discussions of von neumann after it was all over and as he would say uh, this was in later years well the eldridge had a sixth order capability the project here at phoenix had an eighth order capability where did the other four orders come from they came from a very interesting function the phoenix project normally could only produce an eighth order function but it had the capability in terms of its memory systems and the actual uh, network, the lattice of the LC networks, which are the energy storage networks, and the way they were designed, they could store etheric orders of energy. Because it was a 25th order network, could store up to 25 orders of, of energy, up to the 25th. By turning the system on and the station on on the 1st of August and leaving it on continuously, approximately every 24 hours because they went through the entire torus of time through plus and minus infinity they added one order of reality after five days they were the 12th order and by the 12th of august they were well beyond because they left the station on continuously and of course hoping there were no breakdowns which there were not at that point thanks to impressed nichols and his engineering uh it kept running Now the other aspect which was unknown to us was of course the biorhythm problem. That let us go over to another page. The ice biorhythms are only draw in terms of how they peak out. They produce literally a spike. August, 12 August, 12 August, and 20 year intervals of concern to us, and also 2003. Here sat the Eldridge until it moved at the Phoenix project it did not move it was rather well anchored and in the middle of 63 there's essentially nothing there's another peculiar thing that happens as you start this business of going through time let's mark this as 43 let's mark this as 63 and let's mark this as 83 at it and sidewise again you're actually a full circle for the 40 years and it takes 40 years ago the full circle of 20 years where you have a synchronization point you're 180 out of phase which can be represented as a sine wave like so with a crossover point in 63 but this uh, this is a flat representation this doesn't mean it's reversing polarity per se but it does problem was created and the problem is created is this time also has waves like a standing wave in electromagnetic theory on an RF transmission line if you don't damp it properly and its characteristic impedance let us show theoretically a nice little line where we have RF on it 
properly terminated, it's even of constant voltage, and as we say, the standing wave ratio is one. That means you have perfect transmission and there are no waves coming back at you. If this thing is not properly terminated out here in the characteristic impedance of the source and the transmission line, whatever you're using, you start to get funny little things. These things start to build up and you start to come down here to a lower level and these start to build up and you start to come to a lower level. You build up standing waves and these things go up and they come back. And when it gets bad enough, you have enormous voltage levels and theoretically they can go unterminated out at this end, theoretically can go to infinity. They don't for practical reasons. But you get the same problem in time. Got it. And this means something very extraordinary. If you have standing waves in time, you will find that this time factor starts doing this. The standing waves produce a phenomena of standing waves which go back and forth, and if you start whipping through the 63 point, the crossover point, and create a reverse time wave, you then have in the reality in which you're dealing, the artificial reality as well as coupled to both ends, and most particularly in the 83 end where the Phoenix project is, you can generate, and they were in the process of generating a reverse time wave. What happens if you have a forward and reverse time wave hitting the physical earth at the same time? As I found out very recently, and Dr. Van Neumann knew what the problem was and knew what could result. And they had to set up a special team prior to the critical date of 12 August 83 to handle the problem. Had they not found the correct team of scientists, there were four involved, Dr. Van Neumann, a second man whom I know but I will not give the name of because he doesn't want to give him, and two scientists from the future. Yes, I did say the future because with Montauk they could go into the future or the past. They got a team together, they moved hardware to 1963 to provide damping because they knew that if this thing was not damped sufficiently, at least to a critical level, to prevent the reverse time wave from hitting, do you have any idea what would have happened? They would have torn the entire tectonic plate structure of the North American continent apart, ripped off the entire top level of the North American continent, probably to the Rocky Mountains, to a depth of 500 to 700 feet, the ocean would have roared in and we would have been back in the Stone Age instantly. That is what they faced and that is what they had to prevent. And since I'm here talking to you today, they prevented it. Or we wouldn't be here, any of us. That was the problem they faced and that is what they did correct. There was a code name for that project. The code name was Atlanticus Not Revisited. Rather interesting uh, parallel. I'm sure some of you know the stories of Atlantis. They did successfully solve this, and of course the time rift was created without the additional problems. The aliens had what they wanted, including a stable Earth, because I'm quite sure they didn't want half of the planet ripped apart. Otherwise, what was their purpose in coming here? They wanted a viable planet with a society and civilization intact, which it still is. And that problem had to be solved and was solved. There are many aspects of this. I'm not going to even attempt to go into a math on this. Uh, in fact, I don't remember most of it. I think uh, Preston could if he wanted to explain it mathematically. But this problem was solved. <clears throat> the whole thing was damped down and these people disbanded. This was not a government project, believe it or not. It was privately done. It was privately run and the people who were involved were non-governmental and I question if the government even knew what was going on in that respect until perhaps when it was all over or perhaps till now. That was solved and consequently it went on and the physical aspects of our reality remained intact. But here you had that problem, how did you get this whole thing to settle up and line up and how did you get the communication? 
Without the extraterrestrials and without Dr. Costain, they wouldn't have been able to put the pieces together in that fashion because the test on the 20th or 22nd of July of 43 with the Eldridge produced no oddball effects other than the fact they had serious electromagnetic exposure problems to the crew. The ship didn't disappear and nothing happened to it. When it came back on the 12th of August, four hours later approximately, the ship had some physical damage and of course the people buried in the decks and the bulkheads, uh, they had a very, very serious problem they faced. That problem, in terms of the personnel, has been solved since. I do not know the exact technology in which they finally did solve it, but Van Neumann was requested in 1947 to go back and look at the problem and see if they could salvage anything. He did. He solved the problem. First, he had to invent a computer. The modern electronic computer is the brainchild of Dr. John Van Neumann. The Institute of Events Study, the first one built and perfected, is perhaps not the word, but functional, in 1952 in a complete system involving a computer shipped to the Navy in 53 with another test on another ship. And I was not there because the Navy had decided it was time for me to disappear. And that test was very successful in 53, and they renamed the project, no longer Project Rainbow, but Project Phoenix. It was a big umbrella that covered many, many projects. Over many years, many generations of hardware, they did make it very practical. It is now on the B-1 and the B-2 bombers. It's on all the large carriers. The B-2 bomber, of course, being the stealth. And that system is totally functional without any apparent hazardous side effects. I was removed from the Navy in 1947. I knew too much, was learning too much from digging in the vaults of Los Alamos, and somebody with the communication up and down the line decided I had to go. But for this problem and the damping out here from 43 to 83, as a Levinson equation state, there were standing wave ripples which go on for another 20 years after 2003. This part had to be damped. We weren't concerned about the back end. So Duncan and I were specially set up and processed by whom I do not know and how I don't know. But we've been the stabilizing factors on this whole Levinson uh, matrix, if you will, the time stability factor, which has kept everything stable. And after 2003, I guess we're not required anymore. Who knows what will happen to us by then. I was also part of the project uh, called Atlantic is not revisited. I do not know what was done, but I do know it was accomplished. So I think we've fairly well covered this, and in a brief nutshell, the problems that were generated by those two projects were solved. Of course, Phoenix went down on the night of 12 August 83 from sabotage, and it's been out of operation ever since, though there is a new Phoenix at a different location, now essentially operational. Knew what they wanted, they got what they wanted, and today we have a problem with the aliens that will not go into. I think that pretty well winds it up, other than to say uh, my experiences have been put into a book entitled The Philadelphia Experiment and Other UFO Conspiracies. I do have a few copies upstairs in the table where Preston Nichols is located, and I also have a few left, I believe, in the bookstore, and they are for sale. If you have any other questions, I think I have about two minutes. I'll attempt to answer any questions at this point, and then I can talk and answer questions later. A question? Yeah, gentleman, a lady back there with the glasses. Oh. If they have this advanced technology, what do they need us for? They need us for two things. Fact three, perhaps, but number one, in terms of the technology, they need our capability to manufacture hardware to their specifications, which we are now capable of doing. And so far as the Orions are concerned, they're engaged in an advanced base operation in a general, general warfare. And there is warfare going on out in space now. We hope it doesn't come to the surface of Earth. The second part of this is, in terms of the greys, they need us as warm bodies for genetic experimentation to develop a new race. And involving this is also the CIA and our government in secrets, very great secrecy. They are doing extreme genetic engineering and have developed a lot of new things, including a totally new class of implants, which are now biological, not hard chips. And this is only one tip of the iceberg.
They need us for that. Yes, one other question? Uh, no, that's, that's it. Fine. I okay. Only 10 seconds left. All right. I thank you all for your attention, and if you have any other questions, I'll answer them later. Good morning, people. You already know who I am. I think we'll say at this point that our purpose here is not to prove whether or not this project happened. But we are here is to discuss what they did, how they did it. Mr. Berlick already discussed very well what they did. So we'll go into the meat of it. Essentially, the Montauk project was a very large mine amplifier. That's essentially all it was. I have here a very simplified block diagram. You get back up on the platform and you get well, the trouble is I'm having trouble seeing the diagram. Okay, go ahead. I can be right here. All right. Very simplified. It was essentially a transmitter. We had an input network, which was the Montauk chair. That's what we called it. Mr. Cameron, sitting over there in the red shirt, was the psychic that sat in the Montauk chair and fed information into the computer system. The computer system essentially processed the... The computer system essentially processed the information and uh, spit it out to the transmitter. We had two transmitters, drove one of two antennas. There was also a Delta T antenna and a 100 kilowatt noise amplifier. This was the basic outlay of the Montauk system. Nice feedback. <laughs> We will first discuss the Montauk chair. There was two versions of the Montauk chair. The Montauk chair was developed by ITT, or communications for the government, or whoever developed this project. The chair had essentially three coils in it. You can see the Y coil went like this under the floor, formed two sides of a pyramid, came out. Another coil came up, formed the other two sides of the pyramid, came out. The third coil was essentially two coils, one on the floor and one on the top. These provided three outputs of essentially an RF signal. The signal looked like white noise, essentially. But the correlations in the white noise was the information of what the person had in his mind sitting in the center of the pyramid. I have to apologize for my drawing. It isn't all that great. This should be right under the point of the pyramid. And the receiver system looked essentially like this. You had your three loops. You had your three basic receivers. They used a very standard type ISB detector system using the phantom type lock. How that worked, we had the receiver, which we'll have a more detailed diagram of. We had the carrier processor, which was essentially a very narrow band filter that converted from the IF of the receiver down to a very low frequency signal. They had the discriminator, which would just essentially form an AFC loop between the receiver, the local oscillator, which was injected into the receiver, and the thing would lock up on, theoretically, a pilot carrier that was transmitted from the transmitter. But, of course, in this system, there was no pilot carrier. So it essentially attempted to do a lock on the noise, and this made the whole thing coherent, essentially, based upon the noise. And then the output came to the ISB detector. You had the carrier injection. You had three of these channels with six outputs. This is a detail of how the receiver system worked. The basic receiver, the SP600, was a standard type receiver with a pre-selected RF amplifier mixer. The yellow was switched out of the circuit. That was from a separate assembly. Had two RF sections, second mixer. And the BFO CW detector became a third mixer, supply 25 KC. You can see the carrier processor had uh, limiters and 20 hertz bandwidth filters and all that neat stuff, which is very much similar. Technology was used quite commonly in the uh, 50s and 60s and the 40s to uh, receive communication signal. They converted down to 2 kilohertz again, went through another limiter, went through a discriminator, very similar supply. This is the power transformer. If they can focus it a little. Three-phase input, 
three phase 20 kV coming out here. This thing I'd love to put on Bob's back. <laughs> this is one of the amplitrons, I mean one of the thyrotrons. They use four of these monsters in, in parallel. This is a 66 megawatt pulsed thyrotron, a hydrogen thyrotron. The whole thing sits about that tall from the floor. The tube itself is about that big around. They had a cabinet with four of these. You know, boom, 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 boom. Hooked up in parallel. It went to the pulse network that Mr. Bielek described. This is the amplitron. Of course, you can see where the welding was done, the cutting to cut the transmitter apart. You can see some welding marks here. This thing, the tube sits from here. You can see the cooling. And it sits right down into about here, inside of an oil bath. The pulse transformer is down in here. As Val said, they already had, yes, they already had uh, capacitor networks. Each network had five capacitors. They had three groups of five capacitors in the network, 15 capacitors they used totally. It was a typical type uh, pulse, you know, pulse delay line, you know, with inductors in series and capacitors to ground. They charged up the caps and then shorted the one end of the line and dumped the other end into the pulse coil. So much for the transmitter. This is a picture of the building this transmitter sat in. This is a 100 foot by 150 foot tall uh, tomb or a monolith from 2001. You can see some of the antenna up there. And this is the two floors. You can see some cooling that the transmitter sat on. They had cooling power standing outside this thing. They had a field of pole pig transformers sitting next to it. They fed this thing with over two megawatts of power. The generators in the power station, they were pumping at least two and a quarter megawatts into this thing. I'd love to know where all the heat went. <laughs> Must have got hot around there. I really remember it was hot. We're now going to discuss the antennas. Can we focus again? The first diagram I made said overall blotch diagram. <laughs> so I had to fix it. Whoops. Great. I fixed it the block diagram. They had three antennas at Montauk. They had two above ground antennas and the Delta T antenna below ground. What they actually did was they used the reflector to reflect out away from the subject the burning rays, you know, the microwave oven rays. The etheric component being it doesn't know any solid matter, passed right through the reflector and essentially the etherics went out parallel with the gain horn feed, you know, as the gain horn would send it. They had this big monster wave guy switch to drive either the omnidirectional antenna or the directional antenna. They also sampled the pulse from the final pulse forming network and fed it into the windings of a delta T antenna. What is a delta T antenna? Let's now look over here. <laughs> This is a delta T antenna. How do you make a delta T antenna? It's easy. You wind a loop diamond shape on X axis. You wind another loop at 90 degrees to it, diamond shape on the Y axis. And you wind a third loop diamond shape around the perimeter of this thing. What does this thing look like? Here up is one pyramid. Here down is another pyramid. This is two pyramids, base to base, one pointing up, one pointing down. You build up a thought form in here with the XY loops. Using the correlated white noise, it will grab the thought form and rotate it. It will spin it, will spin it into a cylinder, and as that cylinder is rotating, it has to bend time to get the rotation. It means now you're generating ripplets of time coming off this rotating cylinder, and this is a time vortex, as talked of in quantum electrodynamics. So as this thing spins, the imaginary cylinder in here spins, or it's called a spinner in physics, it sends out a field of time waves. All right, let's go back to our picture. And again, they take the output of the noise source from our transmitter, 
put it into a hundred kilowatt audio amplifier. Boy, I love to have that one, people. But they took that one with them. I would have got that out if I could have. They took that one with them for some reason. That went into the horizontal coil. And the two pulse modulations from the final network went into the X and Y coil. Now, by feeding RF into the omnidirectional antenna and feeding the baseband into this magnetic antenna buried underground, this was the same function that they had on the Eldridge. The Eldridge, remember, had an antenna on the top of the mass and magnetic coils on the base. So this, of course, was much more tighter controlled. Here is a picture of the directional antenna. Here is a picture of the cherry stick on the back, which is the omnidirectional antenna. Can we focus it? We can see a lot of two-inch coax cables going into this thing. There's a phase array box. There's all sorts of relays in there. I wasn't brave enough to go get those out or to go up here and take this. That's still there. And you can see dipoles. There's three on each side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirty-six dipoles was in this big cherry stick. Of course, we have a picture of the Delta T antenna for the videotape. Now, we have a demonstration here. This is my own edition of the Montauk system. The CD player or the Mindamp source. You can find out information on the Mindamp by looking at tapes from the Chicago conference. Or you can get my paper on the BioFist which explains the Mindamp. The quantum correlator is essentially an analog computer that kind of correlates the ones and zeros. It goes to the amplifier chain, drives the XY coil. Then we have a noise source going to the Z amplifier driving the Z coil. Now, this is very quickly our surplus store. So much for that. Now let's have our demonstration, the fun part. I'd like to have four volunteers from the audience to come up and just sense, get a feeling of what this is doing. Yes, ma'am. disappear in the hyperspace. <laughs> what I have is I have a picture here. I'm not going to show you the picture. I'm going to sit it in the small mind amplifier. This is a quadrature function that goes this way, just like the chair is. The output of this goes to the computer. Here's the noise source. goes to the amplifier. The noise source goes to this amplifier, goes to the antenna. What's here is being transmitted here. You all of a sudden may notice. How many people notice like a cooling, a sudden cooling in the room? That's from this. Now, I'd like you people to just essentially close your eyes and tell me where you feel you would be standing right now if you weren't in this room based upon what you're feeling. You're feeling something unusual from this. in the audience, I think, is beginning to feel the cooling. Okay, man, what, what, where, where do you think you would be? Dang at a table. There's something at a table there. Like. Okay, sir, what do you... Same place I am right now. Okay, sir? Fresh and medium, driving in a car somewhere. And you, ma'am? In the field. In the field. What's in the field? Grass. What else do you pick up? Yep. Yeah. What else? Uh, plants. Mm-hmm. What else? Uh, dirt. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What else? Rocks. Yep. Yeah. What else? <laughs> All right. I'll now show you the picture. <laughs> Somebody said water in the audience. Yeah, can we get it on camera so everybody can see it? We have a 
have a woodland scene with trees and a babbling book. We have a woodland scene with trees and a babbling book. This lovely lady picked up the thought form being transmitted. And I can tell you honestly, there's no collusion between any of us. It doesn't mean you people are no good. It just means she has a more open psychic sense. That finishes the lecture demonstration. Let's now go to question and answers. You got it on the camera, good sir? How are we doing on time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, yes? Could, could it matter what angle the person stood in relation to the antenna and its various Theoretically areas? not, but remember, this is not ideal conditions. So it could be. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Uh, you talked yes, about, uh, about quantum um, coupling between the two coils in the chair. Uh, how does that relate to what Bearden has been telling us about scalar electromagnetics? Well, Bearden, when he talks of scalar electromagnetics, is essentially what I call a potential wave. It's, it's there, but it's not there. I believe that definitely uh, couples into that, definitely. So that is, we're talking this thing is a scalar generator or a detector <coughs> or both? That term, scalar. Well, I mean, I use that term because uh, of our, um, you know, Scalar colleague. has become mm -hmm. a catch-all for anything that's non-Hertzian. It's a non-Hertzian pickup. Okay. Preston, uh, yes, any, anybody sitting in the chair, would they have an experience of time travel or anything like that happen to them? That's the first thing. And the second question is, could you, were there future, sci the future scientists that our previous speaker spoke about, do you know who they are by name or occupation? Yes, but well, I can't say. Well, in the first question then, people uh, sitting in the chair with the Remember, overcome. the person sitting in the chair was deeply, deeply entranced. His conscious mind was deferred and pulled off to who knows where inside himself. And the primitive mind was allowed to surface, which is a very flexible, pliable function. Yes, Alan? Yeah. Could you please describe the uh, design of the amplifiers, the three amplifiers? and uh... uh, Leave it to an audio man to ask about the amplifiers. Uh, do I have something to write with? It's a very interesting design. It's what's called a distributed line amplifier. This is a design that goes back to the year two, this amplifier. What it is, it's essentially a delay line, a coil, with capacitors to ground. I'm going to show you a three section version. They terminate the line, put in the signal, and then you have three amplifier stages. This is an old style way of getting broadband amplification. I read a number of descriptions that describe this line as differentiating with frequency and the one closest is either the highest or lowest of the band and the next one is the next part of the band and then you got another part of the band. Of course, what do they do? They sum this thing the same way. Output with the capacitors. This is what's called a distributed line amplifier. Now the interesting part, point on this is essentially all these amplifier stages, and that, those amplifiers is 10 of these, five groups of push-pull. They essentially electrically have the gain of the amplifier, the voltage gain of the amplifier, but etherically these things add on a real strange screwy setup. So this amplifier has more etheric gain then it has electrical gain. Another question. Yes, by doing, by doing this time travel experiment,